Well, let's have a big Schmidt House welcome for Jerry and Lori Bowman. Thank you, Don. I'm Lori. I'm the director of the Northwest Carriage Museum, and it's a privilege and a pleasure to be here to talk about our museum down in Raymond. Um, we appreciate you coming out to, uh, to hear our little presentation. We think we put together a good one that will entice you to come down and see us. You know, as director, my job's day to day running the business and everything, but um, the best part of my job is being in the museum and having people come through and sharing the museum. What we like to say is that we are keeping history alive. But I will, without further ado, I will turn it over to Jerry, or should I say pass the reins? That's what we like to say at the... <laughs> How many of you guys have been to the Northwest Carriage Museum? A few of you? Good deal, good deal. When's the last time you guys have been there? You, you were telling me five years ago, okay. It didn't look like that five years ago. That back part of uh, the building right there was our original museum. That opened in 2002, and this new addition we opened in 2015. Uh, we lovingly call it the barn. Do you know why? Uh, um, I'll show you the inside of that in just a second. A lot of people, um, we, we're right on Highway 101, and a lot of people don't know where Raymond Washington is, so I thought I would be a little bit more specific and say, there we are right there. We, we got on a really high ladder and took this picture. Okay. Uh, you'll notice the Puget Sound up there, and so we're just, just south of the Puget Sound a little ways. Uh, and you guys are in there too, but let me be a little more specific. There's the Olympic Peninsula, there's Raymond. And you can see where Olympia is. We're about 30 miles from Aberdeen and about 50 miles from Chehala. So you guys know, kind of uh, gives you an idea of where we're located. So there's no reason why no, anyone sitting here should not be down to see us. We're, we're about an hour away. Um, our museum, uh, this is an aerial picture or, or, or satellite picture of, of Raymond. It's the city of Raymond there, and you can see where we have the Northwest Carriage Museum. We're right along the uh, shores of the uh, South Fork of the Willapaw River. We have a beautiful park next door. You can see a dock out there. We have a nice kayak dock. So bring your kayak down on an, uh, in the summertime. Uh, spend the day down there. There's a lot of things to do, in, including visiting us. Um, our museum opened in 2002 uh, because of a wonderful private donor who um, um, created, well, his family created a nonprofit group. And um, they built a building, uh, and it started with 21 carriages. Gary Dennis, uh, I don't know if you guys are down in the Aberdeen area, there's the Dennis Company down there. Gary Dennis, that was his private collection. And he had it in a, in a pole barn on his property. It was seen by family and friends, but not really uh, open to the general public. And at some point, uh, over 35 years, he collected 21 carriages. And his family went to him and said, Dad, what are you going to do with all these? <laughs> And, uh, and he said, well, if you can start a nonprofit group and build, a, build a, um, a building or whatever, I'll donate them to get the museum started. Well, that collection has grown from 21. We're at 51 now, okay? Uh, we've uh, acquired quite a few carriages. 52 and 53 are currently in my shop being worked on. I'm working on a 1900 oil wagon that I got out of uh, Minnesota last year, and I've got an 1870 sleigh in a carport that I haven't even started working on yet. It's actually called a sledge. It's a, it's a really neat little sleigh. That'll be in there later this year. But um, you can see, this is the inside of that barn, uh, that, uh, that picture that I showed you at the beginning. This is, uh, we have a really neat loft up there. We have carriages and sleighs up on top and a lot of uh, various vehicles. And we'll run through a few of those. When we do a tour at the museum, I like to kind of do a level set with everyone so that you kind of have a feel for when these carriages were being used. Most of our carriages fall into the 1880, 1890 period of time. We have a few that are a little older than that, 1850, and a few that were a little uh, newer than that, early 1900s. But most fall into that 1880, 1890 period of time. And things were a little different back in those days, okay? Us guys, we were making probably three, $400 a year, okay? You ladies were probably working in family businesses and not getting any pay. I say that on tour sometimes, and a lot of ladies say oh, it's the same way now. But, <laughs> that, uh, but basically, families were living on 400 maybe $500 a year. Okay, So things were a little bit different. My, my pair of blue jeans, probably 90 cents back in those days. My shirt might have cost 35 cents. When you went to the hardware store and bought shovels back when these carriages were on the road, Okay, you bought them in packages of six or 12. Why? 
<laughs> yeah, actually she said broken handles, but the, the real reason is because they actually used them back in those days, okay? Today when we buy a shovel, it goes in our garage and goes up against the wall and we rarely use it. Back in those days, they actually dug with them. And so, so you know, you would break them. So it was not un uncommon to uh, buy a package of six shovels or, or 12 shovels. A package of six shovels at the hardware store might have cost you a buck and a quarter for six shovels. So things were a little different. I share that with you because this top carriage, which we call a Sea Spring Dress Landau, beautiful, beautiful carriage, the first one you see when you go into our museum, you could have bought that in 1895 for $1,500. Okay, so that's not what I would have been driving in 1895. Okay, um, in a few minutes I'll show you my little Studebaker buggy. That's what I would have been driving. I would have bought that for about 50 or $60. Okay, but that was $1,500 back in those days. And what I tell people is what drove the price of a carriage back in those days was the craftsmanship that went into it. All of the carriages that you see, that you'll see today in these pictures, they have wooden bodies, but all of the metal back in, in, in uh, the 1890s had to be uh, hand forged by a blacksmith. So there was a lot of labor involved. So the more labor, the higher the price. This particular carriage, it's kind of hard to see in the picture, but it's got a metal axle. My little Studebaker has a wooden axle, okay? This has got an elliptical spring, which today we would call a leaf spring. Our leaf spring design came from the carriage industry. It has an elliptical spring on each wheel. And it also has that very elaborate C-spring system. See those C-springs on each of the four corners? What those do is it suspends that wooden body on four leather straps. So if, I were to sh if that vehicle was right here in front of us and I were to shake it, it just floats. It just floats. Remember the old-fashioned baby buggies that had the big springs on them? Same kind of concept. In fact, on, on those springs, there's a, a, a bolt on there that's called a tensioner. And if this was your carriage and you like to float a little bit more, we could adjust that so it floated a little bit. If it was your carriage and you liked a tighter ride, we could adjust that out so, we, so the, the ride was more comfortable for the, uh, for the owner. Uh, well, first carriages, carriages have been around for thousands of years, thousands of years. When you talk about horse-drawn transportation, um, I mean, they, they've been around throughout the history of our country, certainly, and long before that, as far as uh, horses being built, but probably 2,000 years ago, where they were starting to use wheeled vehicles. Yeah, yeah, chariots, yeah. This particular carriage also, you notice um, it, how the driver sits up so much higher than the passenger seat? You see that? See that distinction? And this one's really distinct, but you'll see it on the lower one, too. You see how the driver's seat is a little bit higher? Do you know why that is? What's your guess? See over the horse. See over the horse. That's what we hear most often. Protects them from the mud coming up over there. Those are great answers, but they're wrong. Okay? The real reason for that is that that is purely a status symbol. If you could afford that carriage, you could afford a paid driver, a chauffeur, you dressed them elegantly. You, when you went to town, you showed them off. The, the lady or the man that would have owned a carriage like this, they would have probably had four or five carriages. They would have had a big carriage house uh, on their property, on their estate, and they had hired help who took care of the carriages, took care of the horses. Um, you know, people ask us on tours because our carriages are just so beautifully polished and whatever. They say, did they really look like that back in those days? I said, they did when they came out of the carriage house. When they came back from a drive, they were dirty and muddy and whatever. They went back in the carriage house and some, uh, somebody's job was to spit shine it again, basically. So uh, yeah, they were beautiful. Uh, you'll also notice as we go through some of these slides, you'll notice some terminology that got carried over to the car industry. You, the word Landau out there, anybody ever owned a Ford Landau back in the 70s? Remember what the Ford Landau was? Ford Landau was a big um, LTD sedan that they used to put a fake leather top on the back half of it. It was a vinyl top, and they put some fancy brackets on the corners. They called them elbow brackets. That's because that top up there on that, on that convertible up there, that's a folding top that was invented in Landau, Germany in 1780. So anytime you see the word Landau on a carriage, it means convertible, basically. And I'll show you one that's up in a few minutes. The one down below, the Seaspring Victoria, that was a very elegant ladies' carriage. Uh, you can see uh, it was driven by a driver, a uh, lady sat in the back. Uh, it's hard to see, but um, there's some very elegant fenders on that, on that. If we were standing next to that, those fenders are actually patent leather. And I tell people, uh, especially the ladies on tour, you knew you were riding in style when the fender mudguards were patent leather, <laughs> and they really were. You know, today if you were to go and buy patent leather, it's a plastic composite, 
back in those days, it was actually a hand-oiled leather that somebody spent a gazillion hours hand rubbing out to make it look like that, that shininess. And they did the, the leather fenders because that, was, that, that helped prevent uh, any extra weight on the carriage, so the leather was fairly light. The other interesting thing about that carriage down below, our Seaspring Victoria, is that several of our carriages, it's an original carriage from the 1890s, but in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and up through 1971, it was owned by 20th Century Fox. So if you guys are familiar with some of the old movies, uh, that particular carriage appears in Shirley Temple's Little Princess. And uh, we, we actually have a film uh, at the, at the mu uh, museum playing that, uh, where that, that uh, uh, carriage is in there from the original movie. I think it was 1939. Do you lend your carriages out? We don't. Uh, the question is, do you, do you lend the carriages out? We don't. We have been contacted several times to do that. To be perfectly honest, the reason why we don't do them, once a carriage or a wagon or a vehicle moves into the museum, it pretty much stays there. These are one of a kind. They're, um, and, and movie companies are notorious for not taking real great care of things. And, um, and you know, we're just leery of, of, of having those go out. Um, it's not like if they damaged it or whatever, you could, um, you know, go, go to the local carriage store and buy another one. So they're, they're, they're kind of one of a kind. Um, yeah, we, so we don't, we don't really lease them out, or, or um, we've been contacted several times, but we just don't do it. Another uh, couple of high-end carriages, the front, the top one is called a summer coupe brome. And brome, another term, term that you guys have heard from the car industry, I think Cadillac has a brome, you might be familiar with that name. The summer coupe brome, brome was actually named uh, by Lord Henry Brome, an English politician, lawyer, and I like to say cheap son of a gun, okay? <laughs> Back in the uh, early 1800s, Lord Henry designed that style of, of vehicle. Uh, it's you've got a little two-passenger compartment there, driven by a driver, pulled by a single horse, okay? That little two-passenger compartment is called a coupe. That's where we get the word coupe from. It came from the carriage industry. But Lord Henry designed that because being a lawyer and a politician and a cheap son of a gun, when he was arguing all night long in Parliament or for days at a time, he wanted something elegant that he could drive or have his driver drive him around London in. But if he, if, if he was going to argue for 24 hours in, in Parliament, he was too cheap to have his driver just stand around and do nothing. So he wanted something small enough that he could drive home himself. So he designed that and, and then a lot of manufacturers. This, this particular one is actually built by the Brewster Company out of New York, one of America's finest carriage makers. The fun thing about this vehicle as well is that we know a lot of the manufacturing history uh, of all of our carriages. We, I pride myself on knowing a lot of that and we, we actually do a lot of consulting with other museums. But we don't always know the personal history of them. This is an exception. That carriage actually belonged to a lady at one point um, um, by the name of Grace Masary. And Grace Masary was in New York. She was a lady of wealth. Her husband, John Masary, owned the Masary Paint Company, uh, which was the largest paint distributor in the East Coast back in the 18, late 1800s. Well, John and his first wife and two uh, uh, adult sons were in business together, had a very successful business. They brought Grace over to be their housekeeper. She was from Ireland. And she was their housekeeper for a number of years. And his first wife passed away from natural causes in the early 1890s. He secretively married Grace. But the reason why it was a secret is because a man of wealth did not hi marry the hired help back in those days. So they kept it a secret for 10 years. They had two more children together. When they finally, uh, uh, that came out that they were married, it was scandalous. New York Times headlines, uh, Masary, you know, so it, it, was, it was kind of an interesting time. But this was one of Grace's uh, many carriages that she used in her upstate um, uh, uh, New York estate. And uh, Grace, like I said, was a lady of wealth. John uh, passed away in the late 1890s. Uh, she was 37 years younger than John. So she uh, lived at like 1938, and this was one of her many carriages. Um, when, she, when he died, she inherited what today would be equivalent to something like $680 million. So she did pretty well for herself, yeah. Uh, the one on the very bottom, this is the Shelburne Landau. Remember I told you that Landau was a convertible top? That's an example of that same top on that, that I showed you on that first one, but that's a falling top. The, the, that top can be split apart and it could become a, a convertible. 
The other thing that that one is kind of famous for, it's an 1890 carriage. It was once owned by the Hutkins Brothers Movie Ranch in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Ace Hutkins and his brother had thousands or hundreds of carriages that they used to lease out to the movie industry. And they raised horses down in Southern California in the heyday of Hollywood. They actually uh, sold Trigger to Roy Rogers. Uh, they had silver from the Lone Ranger. Those were Hutkins Brothers horses. But that particular carriage, we get a lot of advertising mileage out of it because that was Bell Watling's carriage in Gone with the Wind. So if you know that movie, next time you see Gone with the Wind, look for that carriage, you'll see it. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite vehicles in the museum is our turn under seat trap, the one on the top there. That is, um, th this um, uh, carriage was gifted to us about two years ago from a lady up in Squim, Washington. She called me up and she said, have you ever heard of a turn under seat trap made by the Stratton Company? Stratton was a company that out of Muncie, Indiana. And I said, I've heard about them. I've seen pictures of them. I've read about them, never seen one in person. And she said, well, I have one I think I want to give to you. And I said, I think you're a wonderful person. <laughs> and she ended up giving that to us. Her and her husband in 1983 spent $13,000 having that restored. And, um, and her husband passed away. They were horse people. She was downsized and getting up there in age. So she wanted it to come to someplace special. So her and her daughter come and visit that carriage uh, once a year. Uh, uh, but it was a wonderful donation. But the fun thing about it is you see up at the top where it's a, it's a two-seater. Four people could ride in that. What's hard to uh, show, but in the second picture down uh, below it, is you see how that back seat, that front seat actually folds forward and that back seat closes down. It's like a rumble seat in there. So you could have a little bit more sporting vehicle if you only had two people. It's really an incredible piece. What I love about them, because I work on these things, that was 1890, hand, all hand done. So it's, uh, it's an incredible piece of history. Um, the one on the bo uh, uh, bottom here is our Kimball Town Coach. Kimball was out of Chicago, Illinois, and they were one of America's largest carriage makers. Kimball has kind of an interesting history. They actually followed the history of our country. There were nine generations of Kimball uh, coachmakers. They started up in Maine uh, and uh, made sleighs and small buggies. And as people, uh, uh, as our country grew in population, they moved down to New York. They had a large operation there. And eventually, as people started moving west, they moved to Chicago, which is where this coach was made in the late 1890s. It's called a town coach, a, a beautiful vehicle. Uh, actually, it was uh, gifted to us as well. Uh, up the road here, um, there's a very uh, wonderful museum called Mohai Museum of History and Industry. Have any, anyone been there? Um, yeah. I did a project with them. Um, now it's been about three or four years ago, I guess. And Mohai is a beautiful museum, but for every piece of hist uh, art artifact that they have in the museum, they have 10,000 pieces behind the scenes that the public will never see. It's incredible. And I was lucky enough to be able to go back and, and take a look at all that stuff. Well, they had several carriages. Well, after we completed a project with them and helped them out on something, the curator of that museum called me up and she said, do you, hey, Jerry, you remember the Kimball Town Coach? And I said, I sure do. And she said, well, we're thinking of giving it to the Chicago Historical Museum or to you. Where do you think it should go? <laughs> and I said, let me think about that for just a second. And we both laughed. And she goes, no, it's coming to you guys. And we had this up in the shop for about six weeks. We had to do some paint work on it, reupholster work, uh, repair a door. But it's absolutely incredible. And like I was telling you about with the, that Brewster carriage, uh, um, uh, we know the personal history of this carriage as well. Um, it was once owned by a gentleman by the name of uh, uh, FCA Dankman. And that's not a name that you guys are familiar with. But Dankman happened to be a grocer back in Illinois back in the late uh, 1800s. And he had a successful grocery store business, him and his wife and family. And he came home one day and he said to his wife, he said, there's a lumber mill in town. We should buy it. And she goes, yeah, well, if you think it would be a good investment. And he said, but we don't have the cash. We don't have the funds to do that. She said, well, go to my brother. My brother will, 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 will uh, probably back you or maybe go into partnership. He goes, no, I don't really want to do that. She goes, no, go to my brother. Well, his, his brother-in-law happened to be a guy by the name of Frederick Warehouser. <laughs> and uh, within a year, year and a half, that one lumber mill became three lumber mills. Uh, there was a lot of property uh, that they bought up. 
And uh, the Weyerhaeuser Dankman Lumber Company uh, operated in the Mississippi Valley back there for a number of years. And then, of course, Weyerhaeuser came to the Pacific Northwest. And I think that's a name you guys are pretty familiar with. So, yeah, he did pretty well for himself. But that, that was one of Dankman's three coaches, a very elegant coach. Is that a glass in the back? I'm sorry? Is that glass in the back? Yeah, it's actually got glass on both sides and then on the doors. And there's the, the uh, window in the door actually rises and uh, raises and lowers on, uh, on a, on a but yeah. Was it flat or uh, the back side is actually um, uh, wood. And then there's glass in the front and glass in the rear, and there's a small window in the back, and it's all beveled glass. It's all original. Yeah. Not ice and I'm sorry? Not ice and no. Um, again, one of my favorite vehicles. That's a Vienna hearse from 1900, Vienna, Austria. And this picture doesn't actually do it justice because you can't imagine how big that piece is. It weighs well over a ton. It's a very, very large piece. And if you look at all the scroll work and the sconces on top and right in the center, there's a cross up there. It's hard to see in the picture, but all the detailed scroll, that was all hand carved, all hand carved. And again, that has an interesting story. A little, um, about two and a half years ago, I had a gentleman from Port Townsend, Washington call me up. And he said, I have a hearse that I'm thinking of giving you to a museum. Would you be interested? I said, send me a picture. He sent me a picture. I opened up my email, saw the picture, and I called him back and I said, I'll be right up. <laughs> and that, the story on that hearse is it came over from Europe in the 1960s uh, in a big shipping container, got sold to an antique store in Salt Lake City, and they in turn sold it to a private party. That private party person took it to Park City, Utah. I don't know if any of you have been there, but Park City, Utah is famous for their snow and skiing and stuff. That guy parked it out in his front yard for 25 years and let the weather hit it and just deteriorated. And the gentleman that gave it to us, uh, he, a wonderful guy, he was a retired contractor at that time. When, uh, his, him and his wife were avid skiers, so they lived in Park City. He, he bought it from that gentleman and, and took it upon himself to restore most of it. Certain things he couldn't do. He had to have wagon makers make certain parts and things like that. But um, we've had that, what, three years now? Uh, about six months before um, it was given to us, uh, it was used in a funeral in Port Angeles, actually used in a lady's funeral. So it was pulled, she was a horse lady, actually she was a mule person. She had world-class team of mules and they pulled it with her four mules uh, for her funeral. Just a beautiful piece. The lower piece there is our hand-pulled funeral bear. That's from 1870. We, in addition to our horse-drawn stuff, we have a lot of other uh, type items in there. This is a hand-pulled cart that was from Europe, 1870. And what's kind of unique about it is you see the handle on the bottom. That handle lifts up, and you could put a, a, a casket on there. And in Europe, Europe, some of the towns, the, the, the roads are very narrow you know, within the town. They couldn't get a big horse-drawn vehicle down there, so they used these kind of beers. And in larger cities, they would use these beers to transfer the casket from, the, uh, from a, a larger hearse into the church. But what's unique about it, you see the four legs that, that go down on each corner, and then there's handles in front of that. Those handles lift up. And when the casket is on there, there's, a little, uh, there's um, some little release mechanisms on the front and rear. You can actually pull those, and four pallbearers can take that into the church or whatever, leave the wheels outside. So, but it's 1870. The craftsmanship of it is just uh, sensational. It's a really a beautiful piece. We also have an American hearse. This is a carved panel hearse. They also called it an eight-column hearse. Uh, this was made by, in Ohio by a company uh, called Sayer and Scoville, and they actually made a uh, funeral hearse up to 1985. Um, of course, they weren't making horse-drawn ones in 18, and they, they were putting them on Cadillac bodies. But uh, again, all hand-carved, beautiful piece. Uh, has a movie history, was once owned by the Hutkins brothers that I mentioned earlier. There's a movie with Errol Flynn called Gentleman Jim about the boxer Jim Corbett. If you watch that movie, in the first minute and a half of that movie, this hearse is followed by a, an ice wagon and it barrels through this town and delivers a live boxer to an outside boxing ring. Uh, uh, it's, it's kind of fun. We have that playing too. At the back of the hearse, uh, this lower picture is the back of this same hearse. And this is my trick question. I want to see if you guys are listening, okay? So we ask this on tours all the time, but that's the back of the hearse. You can see the casket inside. And you see that little area down below that's got a little drape on it, a little, a little curtain on it? I got a preface before you, uh, I open this up uh, to, question, or, or to have you guys guess on that. But I've asked this question at the end of tours to probably 20,000 people over the years. 
and I've had probably 25 people guess it right, okay? And for some reason, and I can't explain this, only two of those have been men. All the other have been women. So now the pressure's on you ladies, okay? So, but the question is, is that little area down there, what's it for? Ice. There's my 20, how did you know that? I'm just guessing. <laughs> the, I love it because, and again, females, you guys are doing great, okay? Men, you're not, not so good. Okay. Mo the most common answer I get on that is people think it's for poles or a ramp from removing the casket. I've heard shovels, I've heard they put the flowers in there, everything. But exactly right. Back in 1895, well, actually, eight, this is eight, 1888, this hearse, they didn't embalm like we do today. Uh, and for obvious reasons, you buried your, uh, your, your deceased as quickly as possible. But they would put chunks of ice in there. Have you heard the saying, keep them on ice? Yeah. That's where it comes from. It didn't provide refrigeration like we know it today, but it did provide a level of coolness that kept the, 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 the odors down. Yeah, that's a great guess. We, we should have a, a gift for you. <laughs> um, we have some beautiful sleighs. These are just two of our, our many sleighs in the museum. The top one is actually called a town sleigh. Um, some of you have may, uh, are, are, that might be familiar with sleighs, that style, some people call it a Portland cutter. But actually, the, the difference between that is you see that this one has some springs on it. This was a higher-end Portland cutter. Interesting enough, this was made by the Deere Weber Company. You guys hear of John Deere? Did you know that they made sleighs and buggies? <laughs> Distributed them out of the John Deere Plow Company. Weber happened to be John Deere's son-in-law, and they were in partnership together, and they actually made a lot of springboard buggies and, and uh, smaller buggies as well as sleighs. Our beautiful coachman sleigh at the, at the, um, the lower picture there, um, that's not real snow. Okay, at Christmas time we decorate that, but the um, restoration of this, the artwork on the front and back are just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, it's hard to see because of the garland, but that actually has a higher seat. This was driven by a driver. This was a very, very high-end sleigh for, for people of wealth. Now we're getting into what I would have been driving, okay? That little Studebaker buggy up there, it's actually called a stand-up buggy. People also call them runabouts uh, or whatever. Uh, a lot of people see that and they think of the old doctor buggies or whatever. There was a lot of manufacturers. There was over a thou thousands of actual makers of buggies back in the day. But did you guys know that Studebaker made buggies? Horse-drawn stuff? Everyone knows that Studeba uh, Studebaker from the car company. What people don't realize, Studebaker brothers, they're four German brothers, they started in 1850. And they were making wheelbarrows. And uh, by 1880, they were the largest producer of horse-drawn vehicles in the country. They were out of South Bend, Indiana. They had a 90-acre site, and they were churning out over 100 vehicles a day. Most big carriage companies, wagon makers back in those days, if you were doing 20 or 30 a week, you were considered big. These guys were doing 100 a day. A lot of people credit Henry Ford in later years with automation. Studebaker did something they called systemization. And at this 90-acre site, they had all these outlying buildings around the outside, and they made all the components for the various, they made buggies and wagons and elegant vehicles. They made all different kinds. And they uh, periodically would bring the parts together to, for assemblers in these centered buildings, and they would churn out 100 a day. It was really a remarkable process. But uh, Studebaker was, um, uh, like I said, 100 a day, 1880s. The one on the bottom, Fringe Top Surrey, how many people have seen the Oklahoma, movie Oklahoma? You know the Surrey with the fringe on top? Anyone want to sing? <laughs> We've had people break out in song at the museum uh, uh, when they see that. There you go, there you go. Um, the Fringe Top Surrey, this was actually made by the Joseph Valai Company, and Valai was actually a descendant of John Deere as well. He, had a, uh, he was actually president of John Deere for a while, and then he opened up his own uh, buggy company and, and uh, uh, wagon company. This is a fringe top Surrey. I tell people the, fr the Surreys were basically the, the family station wagon of their day, okay? Um, that, that Surrey right there, um, you know, it has a top on it, it has lamps on it, it's very elegant leather seats on it and stuff. Probably would have cost you, oh, maybe three, $350 back in those days. But if you couldn't afford that, you, you didn't have to get, the, all Surreys didn't have fringe on top. You didn't have, to, you could get a, ben a wooden bench seat. You didn't have to get the lamps on it. You could have got the cost down to maybe 60 or $70. That little, that little Studebaker buggy up on the top, 
Um, that's the one that I told you. I would have bought that for probably about $50, $60 back in those days, okay? And again, those kind of buggies actually used to come to you. You used to order your buggies uh, through catalogs. You could buy a, a buggy through Sears, through Montgomery Ward, okay? And depending on what you could afford, you got it with different options. That little buggy has a top on it. It has leather seats, and it's hard to see, but it actually has an optional brake system on it. That would have sold for 60 bucks. If you didn't get those three options on it, you could have got it for maybe $25, $30. So again, depending on what you could afford. I'm going to step outside here because I want to grab a, this. So it didn't have an optional brake system. How do you stop it? Uh, well, the horse stops it. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you about that in just a this is uh, um, the uh, original um, um, buggy wrench that went with that Studebaker. When we got it, we, we found the original buggy wrench. This is for the hub nut that takes that nut off for the wheel. But see this design right here? That tightens every nut on there. So when you ordered this, this got delivered to your front yard in a big crate. You opened it up, you found your buggy wrench, you put your buggy together, hooked up your horse, and went to town. I mean, that, that's how that worked, yeah. Uh, the question was, um, um, not all buggies and, and vehicles have a brake system. It was an optional brake. But I tell people on tours is that you have to remember, those are hooked up to a horse, okay? The horse is your engine and your brake. That front quarters of the horse, that's your engine. That's the pulling part. The rear quarters of the horse is the brake. And if the brake stops, you stop. If the brake doesn't stop, hold on because you're in a, a world of hurt, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, most brake systems on, on, especially on some of the um, 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 larger vehicles, were more for loading than anything else. If, if uh, on, on some of the coaches or whatever, you'd s set the brake, because if you had four or six horses hooked up to the front of that, they were shifting and whatever, and as people were loading, especially ladies, you didn't want it shifting, so that was what the brake was for. It wasn't for stopping like we do on our cars today. Um, a couple of, a couple of uh, I keep saying my favorite vehicles. I mean, people come in the museum all the time, and they, they, they say, which is your favorite? I say, that's like asking which kid I like best, uh, you know. But, but uh, our little mail buggy up there, that was uh, from 1870, 1880. Uh, anybody know where Cornelius, Oregon is? Down by Portland? Yeah. This actually used to be used uh, on, a, on a star route, um, a rural free delivery, RFD. It was used uh, uh, in, uh, to deliver mail in Cornelius, Oregon. And uh, when we got that, it was, it was interesting. I had a guy call up the museum one day, and he said, um, I have a buggy. I bought it at auction. I'm a car guy. I'm a retired accountant. And he said, um, I'm not really interested. Would you guys be interested? So I went down to look at it. And when we, when we got it, uh, it was just absolutely covered in mud and just caked on you know, 125, 130-year-old mud. We cleaned that with quadruple lot steel wool and a toothbrush and then re-oiled it and it just came back. Uh, the other interesting thing, I'm going to step around again. Inside of that coach, uh, it's really neat. You see all his old canvas mail bags and everything? But there was probably three inches of mud on the bottom of that from him getting in and out. When I chipped all that mud out, I found a bunch of horseshoes. And here's something you probably don't think about. You ever see a studded horseshoe? You know, you don't think about that, but these guys had to deliver the mail year round. And just like you put studs on your car where you get icy roads, horses were slipping and sliding too, so they gave them traction. <laughs> they get, you know, and that's, what, that's a studded horseshoe that was in the bottom of that. Really pretty neat. Um, the bottom ca uh, cab is called our handsome cab. Not handsome like good looking handsome. That was Joseph Hansen, who was a British architect and back in the 1780s. He designed that style of vehicle. Um, these two-wheeled vehicles were made great taxi cabs. In, in our country, they primarily were commercial uh, vehicles. This was actually used as a taxi cab in New York City Central Park back in the 1890s. Over in Europe, they used them for both private coaches as well as commercial vehicles. Uh, some of you may have seen the um, Sherlock Holmes movies. You see vehicles like that. But you notice the driver sits way at the, at the uh, back there. Um, if two people wanted to go on a cab ride, you hail the cab over. You get inside, and there's, there's some wing doors there, which are kind of neat. Again, 1890, you move one, and the other one closes at the same time. So there's a bunch of cables that go around. And you see the, the window on the very front. When you close those wing doors, you see a strap on that window. If we follow that strap over to the top of the cab, it would come to a crank right in front of the driver. 
And so you close your wing doors, crank down the window, now you're nice and secured, protected from the rain and wind and all that. At the very top of the cab, you see at the top of a little trap door, he's got a hole in the top of the cab about that big. That's how he communicates with you. He opens that up, looks down and she says, where do you want to go? <laughs> okay. He delivers you to your destination. You get there, he opens up that trap door, he makes sure you pay him before he uncranks the window. <laughs> so you don't want to get stiff for the ride, so yeah. So, yeah, these kind of vehicles, these two-wheel vehicles, they called them gigs, and they made great um, uh, taxi cabs because if you think about the New Yorks and the Chicagos and even Seattles and the larger towns, there were so many horses and delivery wagons and carriages and buggies and you name it on the roads that if a taxi cab picked you up and you wanted to go the opposite way, they sometimes had to go around two, three blocks. Well, with this two-wheeled vehicle and a properly trained horse, they teach the horse to do a stationary turn. We've actually done this with horses. You, you teach the horse to kind of go like this. And this thing will just spin in the road and pivot, and you can go the opposite way, so that saved a lot of time. Okay? And they were great vehicles from that standpoint. Talking about, um, you know, the, the uh, number of horses on the road, um, back when these vehicles were in use, they estimate there were about 25 million horses in our country, okay, 1890, 1895. Today, depending on what you can research, probably somewhere around 4 million, okay? There was only 60 million people back in those days. What do we have today, 330 million, 340 million? So obviously the ratio of people to horses was significantly different back in those days. How many of you guys have been to New York, New York City? Most of you, a lot of you. New York City is crowded, right? It was crowded in 1895, okay? It was a different kind of crowd, okay? Picture this. In 1895, New York City, any 24-hour period, seven days a week, they estimate that there was between 200 and 250,000 horses on the streets of New York City. So, how many people are horse people here? Any horse people? A few of you. If you're a horse person, you can validate this. An adult horse depending on his size or her size, drops about 25 to 35 pounds of manure a day. So multiply that by 200,000 or 250,000 and think what the streets of New York City were like, okay? Um, take it also into consideration that every other street corner was a stable because they had to house and feed those horses somewhere. So you combine that smell of the stable with the, what's on the road and think about what it was like. I've been asked on tours before, what did they do with all that? They used to have work wagons going up and down the streets 24 hours a day with guys that did nothing but this and scoop. And they said, and uh, you know, people say, well, what did they do with all that? New York City's surrounded by rivers, right? They'd back those wagons up to barges, take it out in the river and throw it in the rivers. So um, they say that on, you know, if, have you ever been back to New York City when it's hot and humid and sticky like that? Imagine. Imagine what it was like. They say the stench was so bad, well-to-do folks had country homes to get out of there, uh, you know, on, on weekends and what, to get, a, get away from the smell. So it, it was, it was um, um, a different kind of lifestyle back in those days, yeah. Um, another couple of our um, uh, working buggies, this is a springboard buggy made by the Michigan Buggy Company out of Kalamazoo, Michigan. Basically, it's a little pickup truck. Okay, that's what they used as a pickup truck, a rancher, farmer, even people in town. It's got a little bit heavier spring system on the rear end. It's got a double elliptical spring that supports a little bit more weight because if you were going to town and getting a barrel of nails or something, you needed to support that weight. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's, uh, th we actually found this on a farm down by Castle Rock, Washington and restored that a couple years ago. The one down below, uh, the Mitchell wagon, one of our favorite vehicles. Uh, this wagon was actually uh, just brought in the museum uh, late last year, I, I believe. And uh, Mitchell was one of the uh, country's largest wagon makers. There were a lot of wagon makers, uh, Bain and Weber and Studebaker and Peter Shuttler, and there were a lot of big wagon makers. Mitchell was out of um, uh, Moline, uh, Illinois, I'm sorry, Racine, Wisconsin. And uh, these are the kind of wagons that built this country, okay? Uh, very similar wagons. A lot of people think of uh, uh, the covered wagons coming across the West. A lot of those were prairie schooners, but a lot of them were just farm wagons like this. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second here. Uh, uh, how we do? Oh, 
Ooh, we're running short. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm. I, I'm. I'm going to move. I'm going to move. Yeah. Well, you know what? That's that's our running gear. Um, that running gear we found that hanging in a barn in Roy, Washington. Um, that's basically the understructure of any wagon, but this particular running gear was actually used in construction. There's a road, a state highway between Morton and Tacoma called State Highway 7. That helped build that road in the early 1900s. Um, you'll, you'll, the center piece that connects the two axles is called a reach. This has a slip reach on it where you can pull a pin and actually extend that wheelbase out. That's how they used to deliver their big 20-foot, 30-foot 2x4s. And the most recent piece that we have in the museum, we got out of Northern California in January. That's our 1890s horse-drawn road grader. Uh, pulled by, you can see a, a seat in the front, driver sat up there, operator sat at the back, just like a road grader today. It's got an articulating blade. This sat out in a, in a, in a ranch in Northern California for many, many years, and we had it up in the shop and got it all working. We actually set it up so we can pull it in parades. It's, uh, it's really a neat piece. I'm gonna move uh, uh, quick. Um, our chuck wagon, um, you guys uh, know uh, the history of chuck wagons, food and all that. These were used on the um, uh, cattle drives. Back uh, before the train system uh, uh, got really, um, um, e or the train system evolved, they used to have to drive cattle to market. And um, 1,000, 1,200 head of cattle were driven by seven, eight cow hands, a cook, as well as a trail boss. And um, for that three months work out on uh, driving those herds uh, across the plains and whatever, that cowboy maybe made $70, $80. So uh, it, it was kind of interesting. Um, the cook was worshipped out there. He was your best friend out there, okay? Uh, you didn't do anything to make the cook mad at you, or you didn't eat. But he was also your hotel. All your bed rolls went in there when you moved to the next site. If you got hurt out there, he sewed you up. He took care of your horses. So this guy was your best friend. You just, you just worshipped the, uh, the uh, chuck wagon cook. You can see the uh, water barrel over there. On, it's on the back side of that wagon sink that pulls out. That's where the cowboys shaved and washed up. So pretty rough, pretty rough ride out there. Our um, couple of vehicles that we have are Henderson Stagecoach 1888, made in Stockton, California by uh, Henderson and Son. Uh, as well as our road coach down below. Uh, I'm going to talk about our road coach because we've got another slide on our, on our um, covered wagon. But our road coach, that's the oldest piece we have in the museum. It's from London, England from 1850. And it's actually, in terms of our entire collection, it's our most valuable piece in terms of today's prices. And the reason being is because although that looks like a passenger vehicle, its primary purpose was to, to deliver the mail. There's a big compartment in the back, one in the front called a boot. If you go rent a car in Europe, the trunk's called the boot. That's where they get that from. And as a secondary source of income, uh, if you happen to be going out to the little town where this was delivering mail, you could catch a cheap bus ride. But you were really considered secondary. This was pulled by six horses. Um, it's incredible heavy understructure. It, weighs, uh, it just weighs a, a, literally a ton. And the reason why it's our most valuable piece in the museum today, they only stayed in service three or four years before they would just literally start breaking apart. And they would salvage them as long as they could, but eventually they'd just take the metal parts off, push them off the side road, and burn them. The trains took over that uh, system in 1860. There used to be a guard that sat right at the back here. His job was to protect the mail at all costs. He was under government contract. And he also used to sound the coach horn. And uh, this is an 1861 Kohler coach horn uh, in the original leather scabbard that they used to sound. And these vehicles, as they were going 30, 40 miles, they'd have to have a post house about every five miles because they had to switch out the team. So about a half mile out, he would sound the coach horn and tell that guy, get the horses ready. We're coming in, switch the teams. But when they arrived at town, he would have all kinds of little tunes he could play. <laughs> and he could tell the townspeople, we have mail, we have mail and passengers, we have just passengers by the, the sounds he plays. So you guys ready for this? Okay. Now, I'm a better restorer than I am horn player. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, he would actually stand and actually balance on that front one and, and, and actually play the horn. Um, this is, again, our stagecoach, and our stagecoach um, we actually recently got a lot of fame. I don't know if you guys watch the Travel Channel's Mysteries at the Museum. Some of you may have heard of that show. We were lucky enough to be on that show last year. 
And we tell the story, they used our stagecoach as, as a backdrop, but we also tell the story of Stagecoach Mary. And um, um, we were shown in the uh, new season in October, we were told a, a million people across the country saw it, and they've already rerun it five times. So we're getting people from all over the country who uh, want to see our stagecoach. But Stagecoach Mary was an amazing lady. She was the first African-American female to ever get a U.S. postal route via stagecoach. Okay? She was born a slave in 1832. She uh, got her freedom at the age of 33 after the Civil War, had a variety of jobs, ended up in Cascade, Montana. And when she got her stagecoach run, she was 60 years old. And she got her stagecoach run because she could hitch a team of six horses faster than any 25-year-old guy she was competing <laughs> with. And she drove for almost 10 years, nine and a half years, almost to the age of 70, which driving six horses uh, on a stagecoach, that is one tough uh, thing to do. So she was a remarkable lady. She was, they described Mary as six foot tall, over 200 pounds, had always had a 38 pistol strapped to her uh, 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 hip under her apron. On her stagecoach run, she carried a 10 gauge shotgun, apparently wasn't afraid to use it. Had a standing offer in Cascade, or oh, actually throughout Montana, that she could knock out any man with one punch. <laughs> and apparently there were a couple of guys stupid enough to take her up on that offer, and she proved them wrong. So yeah, she was, it, uh, we're gonna be on again, they're gonna rerun it again on uh, April 14th, I think it's a Saturday, so uh, you can, you can uh, uh, go to Mysteries at the Museum and put in Stagecoach Mary and see us. This picture uh, is just a fun picture. This is, this is a picture, of, I, I believe it's LA, but you can see down the bottom, it's 1902. But you can see at this stage, they were already overlapping with other forms of transportation. See all the horse buggies and everything lined up on the side, delivery wagons, but you can see a horseless carriage down here. You can see uh, they started to use um, uh, cable cars uh, down, uh, down there, electric cable cars. And if you think about these horses walking around, think about that little horse drawn, uh, or that little horseless carriage going pat, 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 and backfiring. Imagine that horse taking off after he hears that. And you can, and it was much more dangerous to ride in a horse drawn vehicle back in those days than it is in your car today. So, yeah. Um, as I said, we've got a lot of movie carriages down there. This is just three of them. Uh, Virginia City, our stagecoach was in that. We have a neat picture of Errol Flynn and Humphrey Bogart and Alan Hale. Remember Alan Hale, the skipper from um, Gilligan's Island? They're in our stagecoach. Gone with the Wind, I already mentioned. Little Princess, we have, we have several movie uh, carriages. We actually also have a lot of really neat artifacts. We have a beautiful amethyst glass collection in the museum in one of our showcases. A lot of um, uh, clothing that has been uh, given to us over the years, donated to us, Victorian clothing and Edwardian clothing. Um, in our um, sleigh over there, you'll see uh, two beautiful Strook carriage blankets. We happen to bring one here. Strook carriage blankets were made between 1865 and uh, 1926, made out of horse hair. Before you leave, come up and feel that. You'll, you'll be amazed at how warm that blanket is, but they were noted for their elegant and beautiful colors and whatever. The one hanging on our wall in our museum is actually Churchill Downs, uh, where the Kentucky Derby is run. We do a lot of tours at the museum, all different kinds of groups. Uh, uh, there we are doing kids at the chuck wagon. Uh, the lady in the big hoop skirt is a gal that works for us, Mary, a uh, young gal. She looks so cute in her hoop skirt and people just get the biggest kick out of that. A lot of car clubs, a lot of different types of groups that come in. Uh, we have a one-room classroom in the back that when the kids come in they can dress up in period costume. They can get on uh, a three-spring Democrat and take their picture. Uh, we can talk about wheel writing. We have a blacksmith wheelwright shop, so uh, um, you know we can we can tailor a tour if any of you guys are interested in any group tours as well. Uh, car clubs come down. Um, the one at the top, we had a Porsche club from Seattle come down. In fact, they're scheduled uh, to come down again th uh, this year. Um, they got the biggest kick out of the fact that I pulled my 1895 $50 Studebaker out, and they got to take pictures with their $100,000 Porsches <laughs> next year. <laughs> And we made all of their um, uh, national magazines. It was kind of fun. Um, we do do a lot of restoration. Uh, this is a little box sleigh up in the shop. You can see the condition that some of this stuff comes in. Um, uh, we had to do a lot of woodworking on that, prime and painted it, and you can see the end result of that. I'm, I'm running through these pretty quick because we're a little bit short on time. Our Mitchell wagon I, uh, I showed you a picture of before. You can see the before and the after. We, uh, we did an, actually a conservation pro project on this, but you can see all the original pinstriping. We're the third owners of this vehicle. 
Uh, it was uh, purchased in Portland, Oregon in 1892, and we're the third owners of it. That's what it looked like before and what it looks like now. And I think we actually have a, this is working on that wagon. See how we're bringing the color back to that wagon? And you'll see after th this same wheel, watch when we, this is me applying linseed oil and turpentine to it. Look what we do to it. And we're trying to do a lot more conservation versus restoration of, of these projects because this has original 1892 pinstriping on it that we're trying to, to keep and maintain, so it comes up pretty neat. We're recognized across the country. We're members of the uh, Carriage Association of America, Stagecoach and Freight Wagon Association. You guys probably didn't even know those organizations exist. But there, um, there's a lot of people. In fact, I'll, I'll be in, uh, in September, I'll be talking in Montana about our restoration of our Mitchell wagon up at, at, their, uh, at their function. Uh, we're, we've been on TV, evening magazines come down, Comcast has come down, various publications. You, you may have seen some of our, our write-ups. AAA Magazine and Journey uh, did a feature on our uh, uh, Brewster carriage, that Grace Masary one that I showed you earlier. Uh, our museum is open 10 to 4 every day. We close on Christmas Day and Thanksgiving Day. We're otherwise, we're open 10 to 4 every day. So whenever you guys want to come down, we'll, we'll be there for you. Um, we have a neat little visitor center, a very unique gift shop. Uh, we survive on admissions and donations, and we have, we have about 300 members that are permanent members of our, of our, uh, our museum. Our goals are very, very simple. Uh, we uh, enjoy preserving horse-drawn history. And because we're in Raymond, which is a very small town, we are the largest tourist draw in uh, North Pacific County, and we really feel that we're helping the local economy. Um, to get to us, you have to come from at least 50 miles. So chances are you're going you're to eat in our restaurants or buy our gasoline or restock your RV at our grocery store. So we're very proud that we're bringing a lot of people to the Raymond area. Um, there's a lot to do down there. In addition to us, uh, we have a public market right next door that uh, during the winter is open on Fridays and Saturdays only. During the summer months, they're open Thursday through Sunday, I believe. Um, next door to us, we have a beautiful seaport museum, a lot of nautical stuff, as well as uh, some World War I, World II, uh, II um, uh, very interesting history. Our famous Raymond Theater, um, uh, they do concerts down there. Um, Don had mentioned our courthouse, uh, that's over in South Bend, which is only about four miles from us. If you haven't been to the South Bend Courthouse, it's remarkable. They have a glass rotunda in there that you'd think you were in Europe or something. It's incredible. And right down the street from the courthouse is our Pacific County uh, Historical Museum that has a great history of logging and, and some of the local history. Um, Raymond is famous for their uh, metal art sculptures. There's uh, 200 of them in town, all over throughout town. Uh, it, it's very, very neat. A lot of outdoors activity. You can see me kayaking there right outside our museum. I'm, I'm actually passing under uh, Highway 101 right there. So, uh, and uh, well, in our backyard, we have friends all the time. So there's a, there's a lot of things to do. Um, we like to just say, come get carried away at the Northwest Carriage Museum. We invite every one of you guys to come down and see us. Uh, we're, 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 yeah, we're, I rushed through a lot of that stuff. I, like I said, I could keep talking forever, but uh, I'd be more than happy to take any questions that you have. Um, well, actually, I have a couple other little things here that I... And we have a postcard for everybody, and if anybody wants business cards or rec cards, uh, we'd love to see you. Call us, and we'll arrange your personal tour. Remember on that stage, or on that uh, chuck wagon? Um, uh, that chuck wagon is an original chuck wagon from the 1890s, made by the Springfield Wagon Company. But it's actually a totally usable chuck wagon. The people we got that from were members of the American Chuck Wagon Association for 14 years. <laughs> they went out throughout Texas and Oklahoma, New Mexico, and actually uh, had competitions. He was most proud of the fact that his wagon used to win for authenticity. She was most proud of the fact that her beans won the competition. <laughs> <laughs> so, but off of that wagon, and when we got this, um, she was showing me different things. See that little device right there? What do you guys think that is? A whisk. A whisk. A whisk. That's exactly what I said, and I was wrong too. Beat tenderizer. Beat tenderizer. That's a great guess. Any other guesses? This is a pot scrubber. Oh. For the, for the uh, cast iron pots, for the uh, yeah. the other thing that I got a big kick out of is she held this up and she said, "What? What is this, Jerry?" And I said, "Tea." I said, "Tea." And she looked at me and she, she see the side that she looked at me dead serious. She goes, "Hot 
how big of a teacup would you need for this? <laughs> well, what, obviously it wasn't tea. So, <laughs> what do you think? So, so, yeah. How'd you know that? Because we had one at home too. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> the, all of those truck wagons and back in those days, they didn't waste anything. So you know all those little chunks of soap that you don't yeah. know what to do yeah. with? They squeezed all those together. They put them in here. This became a dishwater soap. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyways, folks, any, can I answer any questions for you at all? Or? Either the calendar or we're going back a picture, but um, is it around 1890s that they went to the smaller diameter wheel? They used rubber tires, and uh, I'm assuming they had bearings for quite a while. Actually, they didn't have. They did. Uh, none of those carriages I showed you had bearings in them. Really? Yeah. Huh. What? Um, actually, I should have brought it, except for a waste of time because I get asked that question so often. If we had a buggy there, we took out the wheel, there's a nut on the outside, and we take that nut off, and that wheel slides off. Well, inside of the hub of that wheel, there's a metal tube, and it's a tapered tube, and that's called a boxing. And that boxing, actually on the end of that axle, there's what they call an axle skein, and that boxing just does nothing more than slips over that, and then we tighten, tighten that nut over here, and that wheel spins around it. And the only thing that we do is we slap a bunch of grease in there. And on the smaller buttons, we put leather washers on both sides to hold the grease in. But on the larger ones, you just slap it in there and it pours out the side. That, that <laughs> Mitchell wagon that I showed you, when we first got that, I laid on a car creeper and chipped the old uh, axle grease off. It was so hard with, with, an, uh, with a hammer and a, and a, and a chisel. And, and it spent, I spent two days just chipping off old axle grease. But uh, yeah. So it's more of a sleeve that just goes in there. It just goes in and slips around. And then the other uh, um, question as far as the wheels are concerned, um, generally speaking, on, on a horse-drawn carriage, the larger the wheel, the easier it is the draft of the horse. So you want the wheel to be as big as possible. The reason why the front wheel is oftentimes smaller is because of turning. If, if they make it a little bit smaller so that that wheel turns a little bit easier, <coughs> otherwise that carriage would have to be a lot higher and be harder to get in. Yeah. Was that around the 1890s? No, they've been doing that. Uh, um, uh, they've been using the smaller front wheels well into the 1700s. I mean, yeah. Um, I noticed some were the same diameter while yeah. the other ones were small. Yeah, mo most of them are, are just a little bit smaller. Uh, you, if you have a 48-inch wheel in the back, uh, about like that or something like that, you probably have a 36-inch wheel in the front, something like that. Yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, we bet sun should be coming around the mountain. <laughs> yeah. uh, she'll be going around the mountain. Want me to sing? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, there's there's a lot of old songs uh, um, uh, like that, and like I was saying, the uh, Surrey with the fringe on top, and yeah, there's quite a few. She's carrying six white horses. There you go. Yeah. 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 Was there a question back here? No. Well, thank you guys thank so you. much. Lori said, there's rack cards up here if you want, if you want to take that home and tell your hours and stuff. And if you, if you have any tour or fund any groups or clubs or anything, want to come down, call Lori and we'll set up something. You guys will have a blast down there. So thanks again. All right. And they'll be here. You want to come up and, and take some look at some of the artifacts they brought with them. And maybe you can have them play some more horn there or something. <laughs> but uh, no. what? <laughs> no, please. Oh, you know, okay. You're, you're, you're the only person that's ever asked. Uh, it's my request. <laughs> well, we uh, we have another talk coming up uh, on Thursday, April 19th, and this will be a living history one, too. It's not, in fact, we won't even probably use the microphones and stuff. We we have uh, uh, Park Ranger Randy Francom coming, appearing in costume, and he'll have artifacts from the Lewis and Clark era. He, he works at Fort Clatsop down along Astoria, and he's going to give his program there on, on Lewis and Clark at Fort Clatsop. So that is going to be April 19th right here at the Schmidt House. And thank you so much for your donations, by the way. Your donations here have really helped us to keep this popular program going and, and uh, we always covet more but we're not demanding it <laughs> we'd love to have it so anyway thank you for coming and, and i'm sure they'll stay around a little bit longer to visit with you so thank you for coming